Hi, and welcome back to Crochet Every Day with Judy. Today we're reading from Robin Hood, starting with Chapter 17, How Robin Hood Saved the Widow's Sons. Now it happened one day that Robin Hood went on a journey and left the band in charge of Little John. Six days was he absent, <clears throat> and on the seventh he crossed a ridge, and his heart leapt for joy when he saw far off a great mass of purple woodland, and he knew that he was drawing near once more to his beloved forest haunts. He was on the edge of the trees when he paused and raised his head to listen. Someone was coming along the way and making sounds as of one in deep distress, crying and moaning. He waited a moment and then saw an old woman moving towards him. <coughs> she seemed to be in great grief and the tears were streaming down her face. Robin knew her at once. It was the widow who lived in the wood, the old woman who had helped him to escape from the clutches of the bishop. Hey day, Gammer Green, he cried. What is to do now? Has anyone wronged thee, old friend? If so, by Our Lady, he shall learn that thou hast a friend and protector in Robin Hood. Oh, Robin, Robin, cried the old woman. My sons, my sons. Why, what is amiss with them, said the outlaw? They have been seized by the sheriff, she replied. They lie this day in Nottingham jail, and tomorrow they die. What? Hal and Hob and Dickon, roared Robin. Three as brave, lad, brave lads as ever twanged a long bow. This is heavy news, Gammer. How know you that their fate is so near? I am just returning from Nottingham Town, and I have had the news from Lob the Cobbler, she replied. Oh, save them, Robin Hood. Trust me, Dame, cried Robin, his merry face suddenly grim and his eyes sparkling. I am bound to do my utmost for any members of the band, <clears throat> and your sons have a special claim on me. I will give instant orders in the matter. He hurried on at once and never slacked his speed till he had gained the camp in the heart of the forest. Little John saw his master coming and stepped forward to meet him. This is a bad business about Hal and Hob and Dickon, cried Robin. I, master, it is, replied Little John gravely. How heard ye the news so soon? I met their mother, replied Robin Hood, and how were the poor lads seized? Pure ill luck, returned Little John. They were in hot chase of a great heart and ran fairly into the arms of a strong body of the sheriff's men. They were prisoners before they knew that they were in danger. They must be saved, said Robin. I can never face their mother again if I let the sheriff put a noose round their necks. And he sat down with Little John to make plans for cheating the sheriff and winning the freedom of the widow's sons. The next morning, Robin Hood set off by himself towards Nottingham Town. The sun was up, and when it stood at the height of noon, the widow's sons were to die. So Robin stepped briskly along the road, for he knew he had no time to lose. But suddenly he stopped, for a foot passenger was coming towards him, and Robin scanned him as he scanned everybody in wary fashion. Then he marched on again, for this was a quiet palmer, a poor, ragged old fellow who begged his way as he went through the land on pilgrimage. As they drew near each other, the palmer paused, and leaning on his pilgrim staff, awaited Robin's approach. "'What news? What news?' cried the outlaw. "'What news I do thee pray?' "'News enough,' replied the palmer. For in Nottingham Town, yonder three squires are to die this very day. I have seen the gallows of building, and have seen the country folk flocking to the town in crowds to witness the execution, for it is not every day that three brothers are hung side by side. <clears throat> Robin said nothing, and did not appear to pay any heed to this great piece of news. His forehead was wrinkled in thought, and his eye was running over the palmer's dusty and tattered dress. Then he snapped his fingers briskly as one who has found what he sought. Come! Change thy apparel with me, old man, laughed Robin. Come, change thy apparel for mine, and here is forty shillings in good silver. Go drink it in beer or wine. The palmer looked down in wonder at his travel-stained old clothes, and then at the money in Robin's hand, and then at Robin's handsome dress of forest green. Though thine apparel is good, and mine is ragged and dirty, he said, thou shouldst not laugh in scorn at an old man. I do not laugh you to scorn, cried Robin. I am as serious as man ever was. Come, change clothes with me, and take the money to feast thy brethren. So they changed clothes, and when Robin had put on the old man's hat, which stood full high on the crown, and the old man's tattered cloak, passed with scraps of every color, black and blue and red, and the old man's torn and patched breeches, and hose full of holes, and shoes which scarcely hung together, he was so transformed that little John himself would not have known his master. And as Robin put on the palmer's rags, he made a score of merry jokes and cried as he ended and surveyed his sorry figure. Well, it's good habit that makes the man. But he had now what he wanted, a splendid disguise, and away he strode for Nottingham Town. Two hours later, the sheriff was walking along the town streets, his brow knitted in vexation, 
for he had not yet found a hangman for his three prisoners. But they shall hang the rascals, cried the sheriff, even, I ha even if I have to swing them off the gallows with my own hands. At this moment, his path was blocked by a queer little bent, ragged old man who called out in a shrill voice, Heaven save you, noble sheriff. Heaven guard you, my good lord. Well, old Palmer, what do you want with me? demanded the sheriff in surly tones, thinking that the pilgrim meant to beg of him and at the same time resolving that he would not give the smallest coin. Why, Sir Sheriff, cried the tattered Palmer, I am told that today you need a hangman. Ay, that I do badly, replied the sheriff, his tones a little more pleasant as the Palmer had not started to beg of him. Ay, that I do, for I have had the great luck to get hold of three of Robin Hood's rogues, and I will string them up by the head on the stroke of noon. Would that I had their leader to hang beside them. Ay, my lord sheriff, said the Palmer, wagging his head piously, I can understand your feelings. I have heard that Robin Hood hath done you great despite. He is the biggest rogue unhung, growled the sheriff, but the day will come when we shall stand face to face, and then let him escape from my clutch if he can. Ah, bleated the palmer, it will be a sorry day for Robin Hood, I warrant you. But now, here is the matter of hanging these three fellows of his band. <clears throat> I am, I know, but a silly old man, yet I would fain hear what reward you would give me if I became the hangman today. A good fee, a good fee, old man, said the sheriff eagerly. Thirteen pence in money, and the suits of clothes from the bodies of the prisoners, and by my faith, old palmer, a suit of clothes I think would not come amiss to thee. It is enough, said the palmer, I am your man, and I will take these fellows in hand. At ten minutes before the stroke of noon, a procession started from the doors of the jail and moved towards the marketplace. It was formed of a strong band of Norman soldiery with the three prisoners in their midst. In front of the prisoners hobbled the old palmer, who was to hang them. The procession entered the marketplace, which was so packed with the vast throng that the soldiers had to force a way for themselves through the grim gallows where, there, where three noosed ropes hung from a beam. Around the foot of the gallows, an open space had been cleared, and here the sheriff was waiting them. "'Up with them! Up with them, old man,' said the sheriff. "'Let me see thee prove thyself a good hangman this day.' "'All in good time, my lord sheriff,' said the palmer. "'But first I must hear the last confessions of these men who are about to ascend the gallows.' Then he whispered to the prisoners, and while the sheriff thought that he was confessing them, he was really giving them his orders for the sharp piece of work now at hand. "'Hang them up, old man, hang them up!' cried the sheriff impatiently. "'And hast thou a bag with thee to carry off their clothes?' "'Aye, Sir Sheriff, I have bags enough,' laughed the palmer, and then he began to sing. "'I've a bag for meal, and a bag for malt, and a bag for barley corn, a bag for bread, and a bag for beef, and a bag for my, th my little small horn.' Of what use is a horn to thee, old fellow, jeered the sheriff. I doubt if thou canst blow it. Can I not, roared the palmer. Nay, but thou thyself, proud sheriff, shalt hear my blast and say if it be blown truly. And with these words, a marvelous change came over the figure of the palmer. The bent, crouching form straightened itself and became a tall, commanding figure. The thin, quavering tones were changed to a full, ringing voice, and standing on the edge of the scaffold, Robin Hood raised his horn to his lips and blew three ringing blasts. The sheriff knew him at once. Treason! Treason! shrieked the sheriff. Robin Hood! Tis Robin Hood himself! Seize him! Slay him! But the guard of soldiery had other work to do than to seize Robin Hood. They were fighting for their own lives. For at the very instant that those shrill blasts rang over the heads of the crowd, scores of men who had looked like common peasants threw aside their cloaks and showed the Lincoln green of Robin's men and rushed forward with sword and buckler in their hands. A hood! A hood! roared a gigantic man at their head as they charged down upon the Norman soldiery. A hood to the rescue! And the men in green followed Little John with an answering cry of, A hood to the rescue! Robin Hood forever! Down with our Norman tyrants! <coughs> In an instant, there was the greatest confusion and uproar. The peaceable portion of the crowd fled in every direction to escape the fray. Women screamed, men shouted, swords clashed on bucklers, and the guard, assailed on all sides, had their work cut out to look after themselves without attending to the disguised palmer on the scaffold. Beneath the gallows tree, Robin Hood was as busy as any that day. He whipped out a sharp knife and cut the ropes which bound Hal and Hob and Dickon and shouted, follow me, and leapt down from the scaffold. The three brothers sprang after their leader with a shout of joy, and in an instant were surrounded by a band of their friends. Draw together, cried Robin Hood, and the outlaws formed in close order about their rescued comrades. March for the gates was the next order, and the forest band pressed steadily across the marketplace. Twice they were assailed by the sheriff's men, and twice 
they drove the soldiery off with showers of keen shafts and shrewd strokes of swordplay. Soon the gates were reached and these stood wide open, for Little John had left Much and Will Stutely and a dozen more to master the guard as soon as they heard the uproar break out in the square. This had been done, and the warders were already disarmed and bound when the outlaws came marching in triumph to the gates. Out they trooped to the open country, and then Little John banged the gates behind them and locked them and marched off with the key so that no pursuit could be made. On the edge of the forest, they met the poor old widow who had been waiting in trembling hope that Robin would make good his promise of rescuing his son, her sons. And when she saw Hal and Hob and Dickon safe and sound among their friends, she wept again, but this time for pure joy, and she blessed Robin Hood a thousand times. Chapter 18 Robin Hood Meets Maid Marian in Sherwood Forest now, while Robin Hood was leading his men in Sherwood Forest and living the life of a bold outlaw, his thoughts were often full of someone whom he had left behind in his old home. This was Maid Marian, the beautiful daughter of a great man whose house had stood near Robin's home. Robin Hood and Maid Marian had been close friends since childhood. They had played together hunting for birds' nests, fishing in the brook, climbing trees, or running races over the meadow grass, and when Robin was forced to go out into the world, he bore a sore heart with him after parting with Marion. Since Robin's departure, things had gone very hardly with Marion also. Her parents died, her friends proved unkind, and her heart often dwelt on the friend of her youth, bold, brave Robin. For a long time, she did not know where he was, but at last his name began to ring through the North Country, and she knew that her old friend had become the renowned outlaw of whose daring deeds minstrels sang, and of whom men talked as they sat about the evening fire. At last, lonely and friendless as she was, Maid Marian resolved to seek Robin in Sherwood Forest and see if he still remembered the old happy days of their childhood. But she knew how unsafe it was for a woman to travel about the country alone, so she put on the dress of a page and took quiver and bow, sword and buckler, and thus armed and disguised, she set out to seek Robin. At last she reached the skirts of the great forest, and as soon as she entered the dark shades of the mighty oaks, she looked eagerly forward to watch for the first sign of a forest dweller who could direct her to the haunts of her old friend. As it happened, that very morning Robin had set out alone to make an expedition in search of news. He had taken great care to disguise himself, for his fate would be certain if he fell into the hands of the foresters. The sheriff, fuming with rage at the clever manner in which Robin had outwitted him and brought off the widow's sons, had given orders that every outlaw should be put to death upon capture and no mercy whatever should be shown. So Robin went out in a ragged suit of hodden gray with a big hat down over his face and a huge patch over his left eye and a tattered cloak huddled over his shoulders. He had been walking an hour or more when he saw the figure of a handsomely dressed stripling coming along the way towards him. Robin at once stepped out of sight behind a bush until he could be sure that the youth was alone. In these days, it behoved him to be wary, so many and so fierce were his enemies. He suspected some trap or stratagem at the sight of every stranger. But the youth came on with a quick even step and seemed to be entirely alone. Just as he was passing the bush behind which Robin stood, the outlaw sprang out and commanded him to stand. "'Who art thou, and what dost thou want in Sherwood?' demanded Robin Hood. The stranger was Maid Marian and she looked at Robin and never dreamed that her old friend stood before her in the person of this wild, ragged man of the woods. She thought it was some savage freeboater who would be like plunder her, and she sprang back and laid her hand on her sword. This is not one of Robin's men, thought Maid Marian. This is some footpad whom I must meet boldly, or I am undone. So she said, Stand aside, fellow, and let me go on my way. I have naught to do with thee. Aye, but I may have something to do with thee, replied the tattered stranger. Tell me whither and why thou goest through the forest, or I must turn thee back. Turn me back, said the page. That wilt thou never do, rude man. Put me not to the need of drawing sword in my defense, or thou mayst well rue the day. Why, this is a brave spring all laughed Robin Hood. And what wouldst thou do with that pretty little bodkin of thine, youngster? Tis a bodkin that thou mayst find over sharp, said the page, and drew the glittering blade from its sheath and waved it on high. Give way, for I seek the heart of the forest, and none shall check me. When Robin heard that the newcomer was bound for the depths of Sherwood, his, his suspicions grew fast. It seemed to him that a bold, smart lad such as this was just the person the sheriff might send as a spy, and he became resolved to turn the page back. Nay, said Robin, I bid you return, 
Seek your own safety and leave the forest glades in peace, or I shall be compelled to draw a weapon also. Draw, and thou wilt, cried the other, but go back I will not. The sight of my blade will frighten a mere lad like this, thought Robin, and he drew out his sword and sprang forward and made a lunge as if in fierce attack. But to his surprise, the lunge was deftly turned aside, and the slender page met him as boldly with sword and buckler as ever Robin had been met in his life. Clash, clash, went their swords as the keen blades grated together, but Robin did not put out the whole of his strength and skill against a mere lad like this, and so the combat lasted much longer than it would otherwise have done. Nor was the page at all unskilled in sword play, for on one occasion Robin's guard was passed and he received a small wound in the face. The outlaw became full of admiration for this brave young opponent and tried to make a peaceful ending to their fray. Hold thy hand, said Robin Hood, and thou shalt range the forest with bold Robin Hood and hear the sweet song of the nightingale. What? screamed the page. Robin Hood. And are you indeed Robin Hood? And, oh, Robin, I have hurt you. I knew you not, Robin. The outlaw started in surprise at the figure before him. Why, who art thou, he said, and why should it trouble thee that I am hurt? I came hither to seek you, Robin, cried the page, but never dreamed that I should meet you in this guise. And, Robin, don't you know me? Robin had stood for a few moments in great, greater wonder, still, at the fair, blushing face. The memory rose like a flood. I know you, he cried. I know you now. You are made Marian. Dearest Marian, how came you here? I came to seek you, Robin, she replied, she replied, for I have no friend in the world but you, and I knew you not and have wounded you. Tush, that is nothing, said Robin. We get many shrewder cuts and knocks in the greenwood, and as for not knowing me, that is no wonder, for I am disguised, lest my enemy, the Sheriff of Nottingham, should seize me. The two friends now sat down on a mossy bank near at hand and fell into talk, telling each other how their lives had passed since their separation. And have you room for me in the greenwood, Robin? asked Maid Marian. I am proud to see you there, Marian, cried the outlaw. Come, we will seek the wife of Alan Adale. She will gladly take you under her care. So they set off together and sought the hidden glade where the band formed their camp. And right welcome did the wife of Alan a Dale make Maid Marian, and right merry was the feast which was held that evening. For Little John and Will Scarlet went off at once with their bows and killed a brace of fat bucks, and a joyous feast was held in honor of Maid Marian's coming to the greenwood. The yeomen formed a jovial ring around a vast fire of great oaken billets and ate their fill of the sweet venison and washed it down with flagons of wine and brimming bowls of nut-brown ale. And so Maid Marian came to Sherwood and reigned as queen of the forest revels. We'll stop there and start tomorrow with chapter 19. Thank you. Bye-bye.